Al Jazeera podcast. Aisha and Ada, age six and ten, look carefree as they play with their friends in the Turkish city of Antakya. But it took the sisters a long time to get to this point. They are survivors of Turkey's earthquakes in February, which not only shook the ground below their feet, but also took away all sense of stability in their lives. I would like to say I wish no more earthquakes in the world. Close relatives died, and their home was destroyed. For weeks, their mother had to move the family from shelter to shelter. None of the things that they love most are with them. As you know, the most favorite thing for children at this age is their toys and their bed, but they have nothing now. And they aren't the only kids going through this. The United Nations said 4.6 million children here in Turkey have been affected by the earthquakes. Now, as children in Turkey return for a new school year, how are they coping with the biggest trauma of their young lives? I'm Malika Bilal, and this is The Take. My name is Jada Yalkalam. I work together with Save the Children in Turkey as the Advocacy and Communications Manager. And where are you based? I'm currently based in Istanbul, but obviously with uh, my position I do go down to the earthquake-affected zones on a regular basis. So that might be Antakya, it might be Gaziantep, Kahraman Maraş or Adiyaman on a regular basis. So quite soon after the earthquake hit, you were right there on the ground with Save the Children. What do you remember seeing when you first arrived when it comes to kids and their conditions? Initially, driving into Antakya area, the the cell towers were very sketchy. We didn't know where we were going. It was really hard to find our community center because all of the roads that we previously knew were unrecognizable. And finally, when we arrived to our community center, the people working there had their families who were staying at the community center because it was one of the the buildings in the area that wasn't really impacted. So obviously there was a lot of children there and I remember sitting around one of the bonfires one night and speaking to some of the families and a young boy, no more than uh, five years old, asked me also if I had experienced the earthquake where I came from and then proceeded to tell me how he had to jump out of his family home holding his hand of his mother. So at that point, you could understand how much the earthquake had impacted children. And later on, obviously, having further conversations with children, I could see the amount of impact that it had on their mental health and well-being. Yeah, yeah. To be a kid in the midst of all of that, I kind of can't even imagine. Yeah. So when we talk about trauma, that can be difficult, I think, to pinpoint. How does the trauma of what happened show up in kids in the earthquake zone? What are some of the symptoms that you see? Well, most children did have life-changing experience in the terms of experiencing grave loss. So basically they lost maybe some family members, they lost their homes the communities, and also the schools that they used to go to. Before the tents arrived, we turned our cars into tents. We stayed in our cars in the first few days. My older cousin, who was married, he had three children. They got stuck under the rubble. They died. If I had a magic wand, I would want a new life. I would want all the buildings to be intact again to go back to the old times. And what we see as part of uh, signs of acute distress is basically um, some children who maybe were previously extroverted were showing signs of separation anxiety, 
um, being withdrawn in their own emotions, inability to speak, while um, other children were showing signs of hypervigilancy or outbursts of anger. It comes in many different forms, actually. I spoke to one mother around a week after the earthquake. My children are always uneasy. Their self-confidence has disappeared. She told me at the initial start of the earthquake, she wasn't even able to go to the bathroom due to her own daughter's separation anxiety. They don't want to let go of me. While going out in the garden, while sleeping, especially at night, while going to the toilet, my children always hold my hand. They don't want to be torn away from me. They feel afraid to lose me since the earthquake. They are uneasy. Oh, wow. Yeah. And how about how old was her daughter? She was around six or seven years old. So so typically an age when separation anxiety is not a factor for kids. Yes, definitely. The girl is among millions who now live in tents or container homes. Others moved with their families to different provinces to find the support they needed. Jada says that all this upheaval has made some children lash out. We've had other parents also report back to us due to their new living environments in the formal or informal settlement areas. They've also reported that they don't recognize their child's behavior with some children who are showing outbursts of anger, inability to emotionally regulate themselves, or also just like inability to ensure that they they can uh, express themselves and their needs to their families. But other children have slowly started to feel more like themselves. We also do a lot of mental health support throughout our child psychologists. So we do set up these areas called child-friendly spaces. And in these areas, we provide children with tailored activities so they can have fun, feel safe, learn and just be themselves again. Here, we are in a room and everyone knows each other. I feel safe in child-friendly spaces. I feel happy here. I felt like I forgot the earthquake here. After the earthquake, children can now play games and by spending time here, they can forget about those things. So with that, we do grounding exercises. So if they are feeling emotionally overwhelmed, we give them tools of how to ground themselves, of like seeing something, touching something, being able to taste or smell something. So with this type of exercise and with the ongoing sessions that we provide to them, we like enable them to have a better like emotional regulation of themselves. And we can see signs of improvement. Okay, so we're about one month into the new school year. So when you take everything that you've just said, all of the things that kids are having to weigh on top of what they've experienced and lived through and seen, how does that all compound when it comes to going back to school? So... First off, one of the most positive things that we have to say is that a major factor in improving the well-being of children comes from building routine and most importantly, having uh, a daily school routine. So we believe that schools reopening will definitely have a major impact positively on the improvement, uh, mental health uh, and well-being improvement of children of all different ages. That need for routine is why one primary school teacher we talked to in Gaziantep called each of his students to encourage them to come back to class. In the first week, some of the students could not come to school because of fear. As time progressed, all but one of my students came to school. Our students were very happy with their teachers and friends at school. And the school was like a medicine for the children to overcome their fear of earthquakes. However, on the other side, you got to understand that it's been seven months 
since the initial earthquakes happened. And at the, the end of last academic year, um, uh, schools were not taking reports of who was coming to school or not. Schools and universities remain closed. Many have been damaged, while others have been turned into shelters. The government says education will resume, but that depends on the districts and school-by-school -school basis. There's around 4 million students and 200,000 teachers at primary and secondary level. So in that sense, children attending school when it was not compulsory. And for a lot of children, that was a big critical time to be able to learn and adapt back to schooling. We do know that the school year has started. And with that, we've seen that some children are still struggling to go into concrete buildings. So those who are going to go back to school in that way we are providing teachers with the mental um, health support tools to not only support themselves who have also gone through a major experience, but also provide support to the children. After the break, how people from all walks have rallied together to support children in the earthquake zones. But first, we're hearing from you, our listeners. September 30th is International Podcast Day. So we asked what you like about podcasts and the take. Here's what you told us. I'm a high school history teacher and geography teacher from Texas. I listen every day to the take. So I listen um, typically on my way to work and on my way home. And it's just a really great way to get my news. And I, I truly appreciate it. And it's something that I share with my students as well. After the earthquakes in February, Turkey's earthquake-hit region became the site of huge humanitarian operations. While the focus was on emergency relief, there were lots of small gestures aimed at bringing a smile back to kids' faces. Professional football teams held toy drives. Thousands of teddy bears and other stuffed toys have been thrown onto the pitch during a match in Istanbul as a donation to Turkey's child quake survivors. A local imam sang children's songs over the mosque speakers. <laughs> and kite artist Zahit Mungan traveled throughout the earthquake zone to hold kite-making workshops for kids living in tent camps. The children made their own kites and they drew their dreams on them. And then we went out together and made those kites fly. Zahid says he's happy that he and his kites could provide some distraction from what was happening on the ground. One thing I will never forget is after one workshop, a mother came up to me and said, I don't know how this day passed so quickly because our heads were always looking to the sky. We had a really good day. We were able to lift their spirits that way. So Jada, of course, this is not just the children affected by this earthquake. Many of the people that kids look to for comfort, like their parents, their family, friends, teachers, they were also affected and traumatized. Yeah. So how are they coping and what's being done to help them so that they can support the kids in their lives? For parents, we have had psychological and mental health support sessions with them as well. And most of them are also, like, we've had one parent turn back to us and said, no, I don't want any sort of psychological support because I'm barely holding on. And if I open up, I just feel like I won't be able to be there for my own child. As a mother, when I cannot provide for my children's needs, such as showering, personal hygiene, and their self-care, it makes me very sad. So these are some of the issues and the cases that we are seeing, but the issues obviously for adults are also multifaceted. Most of them have also lost their stream of income. They've also lost a lot of the people that they know and their support network as well. So in that sense, we are trying to support them to ensure that they have the mental and emotional capacity to then support their own children. 
For thousands of teachers affected by the earthquake, it's also been a hard road navigating the aftermath. And what we're trying to do with that is to ensure that they have um, the abilities in their hand to an extent to be able to not only overcome some of their own experiences, but also speak to children through those who might have had traumatic experiences that they want to open up with. Jada, what could happen to these children down the road if this trauma isn't handled correctly? Well, obviously, there are long-term effects that could have detrimental impacts for children and their growth and even lead to who they are as adults. So basically, if these are not addressed specifically, children might not be able to communicate their needs with their peers and uh, their families, which could lead to them not being able to make meaningful relationships with those around them. Um, It could also, in more severe cases, lead to long-lasting mental illnesses or substance abuse. Are there any stories that stick out for you in, in all that you've seen? I can give you one example of a case of an 11-year-old Syrian girl who uh, lives together with her parents and six other siblings in a shelter settlement on the outskirts of Adiyaman. Our teams identified her. Later on, speaking to her parents, they found out that the parents weren't able to take the children to a hospital for a check due to language barriers and also the loss of their own income. Mm. So our team was able to support her in accessing one-on-one psychological assistance. And later on, we identified that due to transportation issues, she wasn't able to access school either. So we were able to provide her with transportation assistance so that she can get registered and she's now started the new academic year. Mm. So things that we think are minor is actually major for those communities and families that are actually very Mm. vulnerable. You have to hear a lot of this trauma. It's heaped on you as you're trying to help people process it. How do you cope? What are your coping mechanisms and how are you feeling? Well, I think what makes me go on is actually speaking to children and hearing some of the amazing things that they have to say to us. I mean, kids come out with some very quirky and very funny things, as you would know. So when asked to to provide feedback on sessions, they might say, oh, we love you as much as pizza. (laughs) So (laughs) That's a high compliment. (laughs) Yes. I think that's a high compliment for anyone, really. So when you get feedback like that, when you see um, children and see how they're doing right now and just recognize that you spending the time together with them actually means the world to them. Thank you. And that's The Take. This episode was produced by Miranda Lynn and contributions from Stefania Dignati with Khalid Sultan, David Enders, Amy Walters, Chloe K. Lee, Sonia Bagat, Sariyat Khalili, Ashish Malhotra, Faranisa Kampana, Zaina Badr, and me, Malika Bilal. Our sound designer is Alex Roldan. Alexandra Locke is The Take's executive producer and Ney Alvarez is Al Jazeera's head of audio. We'll be back.